with um, our newest entrepreneur in residence, who's recently returned to the St. Louis area um, after about a decade in um, the San Diego area. So um, working in a number of, of uh, uh, investment-related roles. So that's uh, he brings a lot of expertise, and I'll let him talk a little about, about himself and have a lot of great information for you to take in tonight. So Jack, it's easy. That's okay. Uh, tonight's going to be a rough one. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, just to let you all know, um, my slides tend to be a little packed with words because I like to give everyone copies of my slides afterwards. So it was designed to kind of be its own standalone thing. Um, that being said, I have a stack of business cards up here. So just grab one, shoot me an email. I'll take you to PDF later tonight. So that means. No one needs to be taking pictures of slides, no one needs to be furiously doing notes or anything like that, just kind of sit back and listen. Um, it's been about a year since I've done this pitch, um, and I didn't get enough chance to practice yesterday, so I might stumble through a little bit about it. Um, so, apologies. Let me get um, So, I want to start out a little bit about me, not because I like to talk about myself, but because every time I'm sitting in your seat, I always ask the question, what the hell does this person actually know about what he's talking about? Um, so I like to come right out with what I know and what I don't know. Um, and I kind of know a lot about the seed and angel investing stage. Um, I spent about four to five years um, with one of the largest angel investors on the West Coast, or actually in the U.S., and one of the most active angel investors uh, on the West Coast. While I was with them, I reviewed over 1,400 applications, attended over 600 investor pitches, and the organization invested $27 million into 35 different companies. Um, and that was just the San Diego network. Tecos Angels actually has five networks, and while I was with them, they were averaging about 12 to 15 million dollars worth of investments a year. Um, I then left them, um, and I raised 1.7 million dollars with some partners to support a seed fund um, and accelerator. Through that accelerator, I worked with 16 companies. We took them from concept to product launch, and we've been helping them raise capital as well. Um, and on top of that, I raised about another one and a quarter um, million dollars for three other seed stage uh, companies. Uh, online dating app, um, a mom app, and a celebrity consumer product. So uh, when you talk about raising seed and angel rounds, this is kind of where I've been playing for the past six, seven years. Um, so I've got a pretty good idea of what I'm talking about. When we start talking Series A, that's where I don't really know what I'm talking about. Um, <coughs> and you're based in San Luis now? What? You're based in San Luis now? Yes, I just moved back. Um, so, the topic is preparing to pitch investors. Uh, I wrote a blog post earlier this week, I think it was posted on the I-10 blog on Monday, called Preparing to Pitch Investors, where I broke kind of things into three different steps. The first step is about educating yourself on raising capital. The second step is about building an investor funnel. And the third step is meeting with your corporate attorney. A couple weeks ago, I wrote a blog post on term sheets. Um, I would suggest you check out both of these blog posts, and I believe um, the hyperlinks will be included in the PDF um, if you ask me for a copy of the presentation later. So, <clears throat> for today's presentation, we're going to focus on educating yourself on raising capital, and this is going to kind of be about 25-minute crash course in raising money from angels. Um, <clears throat> Step two and step three, I do a pretty good job outlining in my blog post, so I suggest reading that. Um, and the other parts of step one, besides listening to me, involve meeting with angel investors, reading books about angel investors, and meeting with other founders that have either successfully or unsuccessfully raised capital from angel investors. So, um, like I said, today it's going to kind of be a crash course, and the idea is if all of this you understand, then you're probably ready to pitch angel investors. If a lot of what I'm saying is new to you, then you probably need to spend a little bit more time on step one educating yourself before you start going out and pitching here. Um, I'm going to try to keep this to about 20, 25 minutes so that we can spend the rest of the, the time all in Q&A because Q&A is generally the, the most beneficial, but it will come up with a caveat of in 25 minutes there's no way I can understand all the aspects of your business. So when you ask me a question, I'm going to probably answer it in generalities. So, um, the first part of this, I'm going to kind of go through some commonly misunderstood concepts, and these are 
terms and concepts that when I was with Tech Coast Angels and our investors would ask an entrepreneur, invariably an entrepreneur would just blow the answer because they didn't understand what the investor was asking. And sadly, that usually led to the investor saying, thanks, but we're not interested. Um, so I want to make sure, and, and this is part of educating yourself, is understanding the language that these investors are speaking, understanding the terms and the questions that they're asking is a big part of you being able to get to a yes. Um, so we're going to start out with valuation. Valuation is everyone's favorite topic. Most entrepreneurs determine their valuation off of the future of their company. They'll say things like, I'm in a billion dollar market, so today my company's worth $100 million. The problem is that for an investor, investors are looking at the current value of the company because they make their money on the difference between the current value and the future value. So if you're putting too much of the future value of your company into your valuation, you're cutting out where the investor is going to get his return. Um, and this is probably the most common place where when an entrepreneur or when an investor says, what's your valuation, and a large number comes out, the investor will say, thank you, I wish you best of luck. So understanding this and making sure your valuation matches where you are and matches the valuations that your investors that you're pitching are looking for is key to being able to continue that conversation and eventually get to a yes. <clears throat> um, cash flow positive break even point. Um, entrepreneurs love to mix these up and or think that they're the exact same thing. Um, while the definitions can get a little bit blurry, there are specific things that investors are looking for when they ask these questions. Um, you know, specifically, cash flow positive is really the point when your income exceeds expenses without the help of investor capital. Now where this gets blurry is you can be cash flow positive, but if you want to really scale up, and you need to put in more marketing dollars or you need to bring in you know, more HR, more salespeople, you can still need investor capital to hit those. Um, and then break even point, that's actually when you achieve cash flow positive and have generated enough capital to pay back investors. So if you've got $500,000 worth of convertible notes sitting on your books, just because you're cash flow positive doesn't mean you're break even because you've got $500 worth of debt on your books. You have to get rid of that $500 worth of debt in order to be breaking out. <clears throat> in revenue slash profitable business. Again, most entrepreneurs tend to think these are the same thing. And most entrepreneurs tend to look at this in very narrow terms, whereas investors are looking at a more of a long-range answer. When investors are looking for a company that is in revenue, that doesn't mean that they've made a sale. It doesn't mean they've made a dollar. It means they've actually identified a repeatable and sustainable revenue model. Meaning not, well, I've sold this to one person. It's I've sold this to a dozen people, and I know how to go out and sell to 20 more people. That's a company that's in revenue. Profitable business. When the incoming revenue can cover all operational expenses, and a little more without requiring outside capital for a sustainable amount of time. Again, it's not that I was profitable this month or I was profitable this quarter, <clears throat> since that could just be I shut off my marketing spend or I fired someone. It's I've been profitable for three or four months and my projections have me being profitable moving forward even as I'm increasing my marketing or HR spend. So again, investors, when they ask these questions, they're not talking about today. They're looking at what's it going to look like in six months. Lead investor. This is a great one that entrepreneurs always get mixed up. Entrepreneurs tend to think that the first person that writes a check in a round is the lead investor. <clears throat> when in reality, lead investor has a, a, an actual set of criteria. Um, it's generally that the lead investor has conducted an independent due diligence on the company that they represent a significant portion of the round, and that they're assuming a leadership role in the company. And that leadership role is usually a board seat. Now, a lead investor can be a group of angels, or it can be an individual angel. If you're raising a $250,000 round, and you have one investor that is putting in $100,000, they spend three or four months doing due diligence on you, they've reviewed everything that you've done, and they're taking a board seat, they would be your lead investor as you go out to raise that other $150,000. Now, Keep in mind, and this is where it's really important, is the role of the lead investor is actually to coordinate the closing of the entire round by other investors. 
So your lead investor, again, it's not who writes your first check, but it's the guy that is sitting there going to pitches with you, finding new investors for you and helping you close that round. Therefore, when you're looking at large rounds, $500,000 or $1 million, getting a really good lead investor is key because they're going to be the one that is marching into other investors with you, telling them why they invested in you and why that investor should invest in you as well. <coughs> Due diligence. So we mentioned this on the, on the previous slide. Again, entrepreneurs tend to think this is simply providing investors with company-generated documents. This is the first step of a due diligence process, but this is not due diligence. Due diligence is actually when the investors or someone does a third party independent review of the company and the due diligence materials provided by the investors. Again, it's usually the lead investor's job to do the due diligence to create some type of summary or report. And that summary or report will highlight all the risk associated with the investment opportunity, as well as, and this is important, what is being done to mitigate that risk, either at the company level or at the investor or board level? Keep in mind, or it's important to note, that not all investor groups will create a due diligence or a summary report, and not all of them will share their summary. If you go to a small boutique firm where there may be three partners, they may not actually write anything down. They may do an extensive due diligence, but it may just be shared verbally between them. So therefore, when you say, hey, this other investor <coughs> wants to see your due diligence report, they're going to say, well, we maybe have some emails that we sent back and forth to each other, but most of it was, was handled in, in, in person. So when you're talking with lead investors, it's important to ask them, are you going to be doing a due diligence report, and are you willing to share that due diligence report? <clears throat> so here's the real question. Why is due diligence important? For entrepreneurs, having a solid due diligence summary or a report is actually going to lower the amount of time you spend raising capital with additional investors. If someone's pulled together a 50-page report and spent a month doing due diligence on you, and they hand that to another investor, that's going to cut the amount of time that that investor has to do due diligence on you at least in half. So the better quality of a report that you have, the easier it is to actually close future investors which then <coughs> lowers the amount of time you take to close your M, which gets you back to running your company as quickly as possible. Yes? Is it the practice the occasionally they share due diligence report with the entrepreneur as well or not? It depends. At Techos Angels, we never shared it because um, there had negative aspects of the company that we didn't necessarily want them to see. Uh, especially while they were raising, we considered it, you know, confidential and for other investors only. Right. Um, but again, those are all things you, you can ask your lead investor. Will they share it with you? Will they share it with other? It does happen sometimes. Sometimes. Now, the importance for investors, <clears throat> according to um, the returns uh, on angel investors uh, study by Rob Woodbanks. Meeting due diligence completed by investors on a company is 20 hours with a mean of 60 hours. And what they showed was that if, he spent, if an investor spent less than 20 hours on due diligence, it leads to a 1.1x return. <clears throat> Means they're breaking even. If they spend over 40 hours, they get a 7.1x return. So for investors, doing due diligence can be the difference between breaking even or losing money and making money. And for entrepreneurs, Having someone done really good due diligence and created a summary or report for you is going to make it easier for you to close your round. I know most entrepreneurs hate due diligence. They think of it as a waste of their time. But in reality, if it's done properly and all the groups are aligned, it can be the difference between the investors making money and you closing your round. Yes? Does that study look at the drop-off rate based on number of hours spent during the due diligence? Uh, so I believe the way this was, this was a retroactive study, um, and so they asked entrepreneurs, or they asked investors to list their investments, ones that had exited, and then give a summary of how much due diligence they spent. And so it was done that way. It's very tricky to do studies on angel investors because one, they're really hard to find. Um, and two, you're usually talking about seven to ten years before um, any type of actual um, exit. So therefore, you can get a whole bunch of information from them about their habits today, 
but you're going to have to wait 10 years to see what it means. Or you can ask them about what they did 7 to 10 years ago and hope it's relatively accurate. Um, but I think because the spread is so big and the returns are so big, I think whether these numbers are 100% accurate, I think the trend is right. The less time you spend on due diligence, the lower return you get. The more time you spend on due diligence, the higher return you get. Now the question is, where is the asymptote? You know, do you get a higher return by spending 200 hours, or after 60 hours, is, is that all you need to, to increase? Does that answer your question? I was more curious. I mean, you think that if they're spending more time, they probably bet it on further down the pipeline where they're serious about it. If they're only spending a little bit of time, maybe they would be on killing No, so these are on <coughs> actual investments. So if they spent 100 hours on due diligence on a company and then didn't invest, it's not in the study. So this is only looking at actual checks that they're running. Yes? Yeah, I was wondering, I mean, did they have any other commentary? Like, is this basically, it's, is it like going through a thin sieve versus a big sieve? I mean, if, if I'm averaging 20 hours on my deals, I'm probably making a lot more crappy deals. Yes. I mean, I mean that's basically the message. Yes. Is if you're not... If you're not being selected, and you're not spending a, a solid chunk of time doing due diligence, at best you're going to break even, is, is the concept. Yes? Oh, no, this just looks at all, um, it lumps all investments together. Uh, I mean, the report is available uh, to anyone that wants. Um, so now I'm going to kind of shift. Um, and this is going to kind of get into the scared straight part of the program. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, the first thing I want to mention is that not all startups are created equal. Um, and this is, I pulled these from a, an article by Steve Blank, who's actually the father of the lean entrepreneur uh, movement, um, in an article he wrote for the Wall Street Journal. And he identifies six different types of startups. <clears throat> Uh, there are lifestyle startups, which are essentially where entrepreneurs work to live their passion. You've got small business startups, where someone's working to feed their family. Those are generally like your brick and mortar businesses. Now, <clears throat> there's absolutely nothing wrong with lifestyle startups and small business startups. They can make the owners and the founders significant amount of capital. But the problem is they don't represent the type of exit potential that an investor is looking for. And so if you have a lifestyle startup or a small business startup, and you go and you pitch an investor that's looking for an outsized return via an IPO, there's misalignment. It has nothing to do with your business not being a good business when they say, no, I'm not interested. It's simply that your type of business doesn't align with the type of investments they're looking to make. Another group, they call them social startups, and which are driven to make a difference, and large company startups, uh, innovator of right, that's usually spin-outs or smaller projects within a larger corporation. Again, <clears throat> these can be great companies, they can make great products, but they may not align with the types of returns investors are looking for. Most investors are looking for to invest in something that he calls scalable startups, which are born to be big. Think Facebook, think Tesla, Think anything that's eventually going to say IPO or a viable startup, which means from the beginning they're an acquisition partner. <clears throat> think drug discovery companies that know Pfizer is going to buy them out. Um, think of WhatsApp that was acquired by Facebook. Um, think Instagram that was acquired by Facebook. It was difficult for those companies at that time to ever create a large enough company on their own to go public, so they were being built so that they could be acquired by a larger company. And that either the IPO or the potential for an acquisition or merger is what is driving the investment return potential for the investor. So again, you need alignment between the type of company you are and the type of exit the investor is looking for. If you're one of these top ones, you know, more traditional loans or doing an investment where you're going to be paying out dividends is going to align more with the investor you want. Buying equity in a lifestyle startup that's never going to exit isn't going to be able to offer an exit opportunity or, or a return potential for the investor. I have a question about that. Yeah. With the last two, how is there? Does there have to be a difference, or can the startup say like, "Well, we want to IPO, but if we get invest, if we get acquired at some point, that's we, fine with us too." IPOs are really, really hard. Most early stage investors 
don't invest in companies that say our plan is to IPO, just because it takes so much capital um, and it takes so much time that the chances of them actually seeing a return um, on an IPO are, are difficult. But I mean, is that something you have to basically decide at the beginning? You have to I mean, you have to have an exit plan. Yeah. What your exit plan is, is going to be specific to your company, but needs to align with the investor that, that you're, you're talking to. Um, so in all fairness, now we're going to talk a little bit about the investor. So not all investors are created equal. You've got friends and family, um, which are generally investing specifically in the founder and not the business model or solution. <coughs> And you have unsophisticated investors, which are generally new to angel investing. You're looking at less than two to three years of experience. Um, pros are it's fairly easy to convince them to write a check. The cons are they can't really offer you much help beyond the one check they wrote you. They're probably not going to be able to write you multiple checks if you run out of money. And sometimes they can be more trouble than the value of their capital because they're unsophisticated and they don't really know what's going on. A lot of times what you have problems with unsophisticated investors is they expect because they heard of Facebook five years after Facebook launched and two years before Facebook IPO, they expect all tech companies to IPO in two years. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that can lead to some alignment issues um, when you're talking about governing your company. Um, domain experts are investors with a heavy expertise in a single market. Just really nice because they easily understand the problem you are addressing and the potential financial gains for the, that the, the solution can represent. They can also add tremendous value to the company beyond capital. However, that is generally within that market. Um, the cons are they can be very difficult to identify, especially depending on how niche your market is. Um, and they have a very narrow investment thesis, which means if you're off by a little bit, they're not going to be interested. <coughs> Um, then there's general investors. <clears throat> they're investing in the best investment opportunities regardless of the market or industry. The pros are they're generally very easy to identify and because they're kind of opportunistic, they can have lots of value beyond the cap a little that they're investing in and, and their specific market expertise. The problem is though, you're competing with a number of different investment opportunities across a variety of different industries. They're literally looking for the best investment opportunity. Not necessarily the best in your market, or not necessarily you know the best um, of that type of product. Within the general investors, you have individuals and you have groups. Um, individual angels, it's usually easier to schedule meetings with them, and they can be quick to make an investment decision. You're talking accredited investors. Yes. Groups, uh, they certainly offer access to more investors. Techos Angels San Diego had 120 members. Techos Angels in general had between 300 and 350 members, um, but because they're working with that many, they have rigid schedules, um, and sometimes that can be a limitation. So real quick, just to talk a little bit about individual investors versus institutional capital. Um, one of the pros of investing with, or of using an individual investor is they're investing their own capital, which means they can invest in things that they're passionate about. Um, and you need to keep in mind that they're generally writing a personal check. Um, and there's also usually less pressure to become a unicorn or achieve an outsized return. Um, the cons are you're at the risk of economic events that are out of your control. Um, I've seen a number of times when the market turns down where you know an investor says, look, I know I told you I was going to give you $25,000, but my portfolio just lost 30% value. I can't write you a check right now. Um, the best was I had an investor tell a company, look, I know I told you I'd give you, you know, $25,000, but my daughter just got engaged and I have to pay for the wedding, so I'm not going to be writing any checks for the next year and a half. Um, this is the problem when people are writing personal checks. There are things that can be outside of your control that can influence their ability to write your check or not. When you're dealing with an institutional capital, they literally have X amount of money that they have to invest. Um, doesn't matter what's going on with the market, doesn't matter what's going on in their personal lives, their job is to invest that money. Jack, yep. on that institutional capital, so you're talking private equity and VCs there, is that correct? I mean, anyone who's investing someone else's money. Okay, and versus individual investors, investing in major group, group, and then well, it can or, be, or personally investing. It's investing their own money. Okay. Their own money versus being paid to invest someone else's money. So. 
These next four or five slides are going to kind of go over a couple <coughs> concepts that I don't think many entrepreneurs understand um, and that you really need to understand uh, to be able to pull this off. So, <coughs> as of 2015 or so, there were over 300,000 active angel investors in the U.S., which funded 71,000 ventures and invested you know, just under $25 billion in 2014. Clarify exactly what this means. Angel investors as individual or a group of individuals? Or? Individual investors. There's over 300,000 individual. individual investors. They can be acting as individuals, they can work as a group. But and there how are. How do you define angel investor? Can you see that definition? Accredited investor willing to write a check and, and a high risk card. Okay. How do you define an accredited investor? A uh, million dollars in capital reserve, not including the primary residence of their home or. Two hundred thousand dollars of income or three hundred thousand yeah. family. Yeah. There's an actual definition by the SEC. SEC. In contrast, VCs, which are invested in other people's money, invested just under fifty billion dollars in about four and a half thousand ventures. Now, if my math is correct, venture capitalists invested twice the amount of money, but they did it in sixteen fold less companies. <coughs> So the point of this slide is everyone says, oh, I'm just going to go out and I'm going to raise $5 million for a venture capitalist. If you're going to raise $5 million for a venture capitalist, are you in the top 4,000 deals this year? Versus, are you in the top 75,000 deals? <coughs> a couple more. Who, who gets better return, by the way? I don't think there's an answer to that question. It depends on the individual investment and then the portfolio. And the, the average angel deal size um, in 2015 was just under $350,000 with a pre-money valuation of $2.3 million. Keep this in mind. I hear people all the time, I'm going to go raise a million dollars from angels at a $10 million valuation. The average angel deal is $350,000 with a valuation of $2.3 million. Also keep in mind the number of checks angel investors wrote last year, meeting of two, mean of four. The question becomes, are you in the top two to four deals that investor is seeing that year? An angel investor on you know writes between ten or a median of ten and a mean of twenty checks in their career. Again, are you in the top ten to twenty deals that investor is going to see in their career? Size of angel checks, median $25,000, mean of $35,000. So let's do the math on this. If you want to raise a million dollars from angels, if the average check size is $25,000, you have to get 40 people to agree to write you a check. That means you need to talk to between 300 and 500 angel investors. <coughs> Interestingly, women comprise approximately 25% of all angel investors. So, these numbers are based off of my experience with Techos Angels. Um, at Techos Angels, we were getting approximately 20 applications a month, 250 applications a year. I reviewed every one of the applications. We had a life science committee and we had a high tech committee. So, half of the applications that were submitted never even got to the committee. The committee was composed of somewhere between 6 to 15 of our individual investors that had expertise in that. From there, there was another 25 or another 50% drop off. So only 25% of all the deals we saw actually made it to one of our monthly membership meetings. That means 75% of all the companies that sent an application to Techless Angels never even got to the full membership. Now, moving beyond that, only 10% of the deals. <clears throat> that were um, that application submitted made it to what we call a deep dive meeting. Deep dive meeting was where we took six to eight of our interested members, booked the conference room with the entrepreneurs, and we spent two to three hours just grilling them, talking about all aspects of their business. The goal of the deep dive meeting was to identify which companies we were interested in doing a full due diligence effort on. Our due diligence effort would last anywhere from one to three or four months. Only 5% of the companies that applied each year made it that far, and we were funding less than 4% of companies. Venture capitalists, on the other hand, are funding less than 1% of the companies that apply. So these are the realities when you apply to an angel group. You know, 
know, this is what their funnel looks like. Yes? This is just a statistic, but I'm curious what kind of arguments to go and filter. That's like a three hour lecture. Because <laughs> it's very individualized based on the deal. What about the Archangels? What do they fund? Uh, I don't know, but I, most angels are funding, most angel groups are funding about 5% of the deals, basically. Yes? Um, how often would somebody go through the process and maybe not get down to your small group, but maybe they had something that was interesting to uh, some of your membership and might get some side deals instead outside of the group? Kind of, is it worth going through the process sometimes because you pick up interested individuals? I mean, I always tell people you should always pitch because you never know who's in the room. Right. Um, I've certainly seen companies pitch that didn't get funded but picked up a key advisor. I've seen companies that pitched a seed round that didn't get very far that came back for you know a later seed round and got investment. Um, and I have seen a handful of deals get kicked out to the side and two or three guys you know just invested. So it happens. It does. Um, but usually it meant that you had to get to here. Right. So you had to be in the top 25% to even get in front of, and then you had to have that investor that was interested sitting in, in that monthly meeting. Um, I think I'll wait about two or three more slides. So I want to comment on something. You know, it's becoming easier to launch companies. Because it's becoming easier to launch companies, investors are getting better deal flow. They're getting more deal flow. Because of that, angels used to be investing right here in what we used to call like the product or prototype stage. And this was probably true maybe even as early as seven years ago. But now they're up here. If you go to Tecos Angels, if you go to you know Arch Angels, they're going to want to see traction. They're going to want to see first customers. They're going to want to see proof of concept. This idea of you being able to go to a group of angels or, or get you know $500,000 on an idea or an MVP um, that just launched, is it's, that's not realistically what's happening these days. Um, so you're having to kind of fund this gap yourself, which can become difficult. Um, yes? I like your slide, but I want to give you some pushback because I'm going through the investment life cycle in St. Louis, and I'm seeing most venture capitalists want to see you in a growth phase. It's not cool that you got one or two customers. That's what they expect. Oh, venture capitalists, yeah, no, they're up here in growth. And like yeah. I'm saying, this whole thing, I, I meant my point investors, is this whole thing is shifting. I see in, angel, in St. Louis, angel and seed funding wants to be at that growth phase. Yes. That's my perspective. They're wanting to be in here. They're wanting to see your first customer. They're wanting to see you grow. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. So the point is, this is what happened seven to ten years ago. Now take every one of these and shift them up one. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is this regional at all? Like in, in, out in Silicon Valley? So, okay. <clears throat> so again, you know, if you're looking at previously, angels used to invest in this kind of MVP stage. Now they're over here in product market fit. You know, they're wanting you to actually have customers that are using it, that are coming back, that are you know, actually using it according to your the hypothesis that you put forward. Which means this valley of death is getting even bigger. Which means you need to keep this in mind as you're out building your capital roadmap because stalling here, running out of money here, is the kiss of death these days. Yes? Uh, Jack, you said angels uh, only fund 5% of the deals in the pipeline? The angels I've worked with. Okay. And then uh, for VCs, that's, that's less than 5%? Less than 1%. Less than 1%. Sometimes even less than half percent from the, the people that put their numbers out. I mean, you got to keep in mind, most VCs will get one to 5,000 applications a year. Right. Now, probably half of those they can cut right away because they're either wrong market or you know they're wrong stage, so that that throws you know that number off of it. Um, but still, if they're looking at five thousand deals, they're probably funding you know again they're probably only doing a dozen investments here. Um, so there's a lot of words on here because these are someone else's words, so I wanted to get them right. These are actually from two different blog posts, um, which are hyperlinked. 
this is a concept I've been seeing coming out in the past three or four months that I think is really dead on. It's something you guys need to keep in mind. It's <clears throat> seed is now a phase. It's no longer a single round. Um, and kind of this idea of you have a pre-seed, a seed, a post-seed, a pre-A, an A, an A prime, a bridge, a B, it's gone. And that there's really just three different stages. And the stages are defined by series A. And then anything before your series A is literally you're just trying to figure stuff out. You're trying to pull together enough evidence and enough traction to justify your series A investment. And now once you get your series A investment, the whole goal of series A is <coughs> completing this complex transition from a company with a great offering that could scale to a company with a great offering that is rapidly and predictably scaling. And once you're in the rapidly and predicting, predictably scaling phase, you're now in growth. And then any money that goes in, it's just like a machine. You know for every $5 you put in, you can produce you know, $1,000 worth of revenue. And that growth stage can then go on infinitely, um, as long as you need to grow or, or until you reach an exit potential. But you know, I wanted to point this out. You know, it, seed isn't around. It's a period of time where you are starting, learning, and iterating to a business that has proven its core value proposition and raises a seed, a series A to begin scaling. So a lot of times people come to me and say, well, Jack, I need $1.5 million to get to my, my series A, so I'm going to raise a $1.5 million seed round from angel investors. And then I go, well, you know, that's going to be 60 investors. <coughs> What I usually tell them is take that $1.5 million and break that up into three or four rounds. And figure out, you know, what will $250,000 get you? Will it take you to a value inflection point? And then from that, can you raise $500,000? Then from that, can you raise another $500,000 or $750,000? That by breaking it up, <clears throat> one, you actually allow yourself to, you know, increase the value of your company every time you're bringing in additional capital. So it saves you a little bit on the equity that you're giving up. But two, if you've never raised any money, who's going to give you one and a half million dollars? That is a legitimate question. But if you've raised two hundred fifty thousand dollars and you spent that wisely, both capital efficient and you know effectively hit your milestones, someone will be willing to give you five hundred thousand dollars. And if now you can say, well, I've spent seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, I've done all of this, and I've hit all of my milestones, someone will give you another seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. And then when you can say, look, look what I've done with one and a half million dollars. Someone will give you three to five million dollars. <clears throat> so, this is kind of a sobering statistic. So, in 2010, almost 60% of the companies that raised the seed round were able to raise an equity round. In 2016, that dropped to 11%. It's getting, just because you get your seed round, doesn't guarantee you're going to get your A or any subsequent round. It's getting harder to raise more capital. Just in the 89% of cases they fail, and the CC round of investors lost their money, or not? I'm not sure. I mean, you'll have to read the full study. So just a couple final thoughts. Um, most people don't think about it this way, but your main competition for capital is not actually from your direct competitors. It's actually from the deal the investors saw right before you or right after you. <coughs> And now raising capital from outside investors is extremely diff difficult and requires alignment between the investors and entrepreneurs. And we went through, you know, it could be alignment on your exit potential, it could be alignment on your stage, it could be alignment on your market. There's a lot of different types of alignment that really needs to be there in order for you to get a yes. And then it's even more challenging when you give an investor a reason to say no simply because you can't understand each other or your expectations are not aligned. So this really speaks to, and, and part of my blog post was about building your investor funnel, you know. Every investor isn't necessarily an investor for you, so when you build your funnel, you have to build it full of investors that are actually interested in what you're offering. Um, and that's going to be the only way to tilt the balance in your favor. <clears throat> that a successful fundraising effort requires entrepreneurs to spend some time learning investors' motives and their expectations. I think just a couple more slides. Um, so I10 has some amazing programs. Um, they have a mentor match database, which allows you to go in and find mentors um, that have expertise and things that you need help with. Um, they also have an entrepreneurs in residence program, which is myself, where they essentially pay me a small amount of money to meet with you guys. 
Um, and they just launched these Eureka validation mod modules, which I love because it clearly breaks down different aspects of your company. Um, and if you go through them, it should force you to think about all the different aspects and answer all the questions that an investor is going to want you to understand. Um, and then lastly, they have this investor readiness program. Um, it comes with a mock angels pitch session, which is literally you'll pitch in front of <coughs> about a dozen mock angels. You'll get feedback. Um, we'll go through all of your due diligence um, documents that you submit and we'll critique them. Um, and then when you've graduated, it involves introductions to local investors as well as some service provider perks. So anything you want to add to that? Oh, that's great. All right. But <laughs> if you haven't signed up, you should. Um, well, just go to the if website. You're a tech product company, so that's the only caveat. Um, that's more and more companies that have a component to their business anyway. But yeah, so, go ahead. Um, we got about 15 minutes. Yeah, okay. I think this is my last slide. A couple additional resources. Angel Capital Association has an entire knowledge center. Um, they're kind of the trade association for angel investors. <coughs> Techos Angels has a resource center. Um, Bill Payne is a famous angel investor, has definitive guide to raising money from angels. It's a free download. Um, and three of my favorite books that I think every entrepreneur needs to read, Angel Investing by David Rose. Early Exits by Basil Peters, it talks about exits and aligning your exits with your investor expectations. And then Venture Deals, Be Smarter Than Your Lawyer and Venture Capitalist by Brad Feld and Jason Mendelson of the Foundry Group. If you're raising capital, you need to read that book. That book will tell you everything you need to know about raising capital. Um, and if you haven't read the book, you don't understand raising capital, you're not going to understand what terms you're agreeing to. Um, and that could cost you in the end. So, um, send me an email if you want a copy of the slides. So, questions? Um, yeah, I have two questions actually. So, uh, one, so you, you mentioned valuation and how a company's actual valuation right now is different from what entrepreneurs typically think their valuation could be in the long term. So, would a way to judge your current valuation be like money you invested and like time worth in the program? So, if I say my team worth 5,000 hours in this product, um, there's, and I have an entire presentation on how to value a pre-revenue stage company. There's probably four or five methods out there. My favorite is the Perkins method. There's a the scorecard method. Um, there's maybe the value add method. Again, if you go to the Angel Resource, uh, Angel Capital Association, I think they've got some stuff in there. But there are set ways of setting a valuation for a pre-revenue company. Once you're in significant revenues, it becomes you know, what is the multiple on EBITDA, what is the multiple on revenue, and that's usually determined by the market. And my other question, um, so you've been talking about due diligence a lot, but what would an entrepreneur do to prepare um, when when an uh, uh, investor does due diligence, they obviously ask the entrepreneur for resources, or for like information? Yeah, Techos Angels, we requested, I don't know, 100, 150 different documents. Um, if you go through the Investor Preparedness Program with I-10, they've got a list of probably 50, 60 documents. Um, getting one of those lists will tell you what you need to do to prepare, and if you look at that and you're like, crap, I only have five of these, then, then you got some work to do. And they're not difficult documents. Um, some of it is literally just good corporate governance and having copies of things. They're difficult if you didn't think about them at the beginning. Yes. So yes. That's Anything else? Yeah? Um, so you mentioned that it's getting harder and harder with the expectations are higher for angel investors. Um, they expect more from you um, with this. So do you have any advice or what is filling in the value of the business? <coughs> the easiest thing is accelerators. You know, most accelerators will give you somewhere between fifty to hundred thousand dollars, and they'll teach you how to raise money, and they'll make introductions to investors that might be willing to invest before you've got you know full traction. Um, other than that, bootstrap as long as you possibly can. See if you can build an early revenue stream to just keep the lights on. Um, consult on the side. I mean. There's a surprising number of my 16 Canopy San Diego portfolio companies that drive Uber at night. Um, exactly. Um, and the day. Yeah, so, um, 
I mean, there's no real answer. And it's not necessarily that their expectations are getting higher. It's that they have so many deals to choose from, they can just put their money in more de-risk deals. And that's, again, because the guys upstream have moved up one, too. Um, and again, because there are so many deals for them, everyone's able to kind of move up one rung of the ladder. And unfortunately, there hasn't anything that's come in. But non-dilutive, whether it be Arch Grants, whether it be SBIR, SBA, anything like that, um, I mean, pretty much anything to make, borrow, and steal to kind of get you through that, um, you know, type of thing. Is that... Yeah, I was just gonna say, is that it's? I would imagine that's because there's just more people trying to come in, or is it because people are the, the investors are being more risk adverse? If you have ten deals sitting in front of you, and one has been way more de-risk than the other, and you're making than the others, and you're making one investment that quarter, which one are you going? Yeah, um, and it's simply that there are. <clears throat> the barriers to entry of starting a business are low. Okay. So whether it be cloud people. computing, whether it be fractional C-level people, whether it be offshore development, whether it be whatever, it's whether it be that it's just cool and sexy right now to have a startup. All of this has created a you know larger group of people looking for seed funding. And if you have a larger group of people looking for seed funding, you have to do more to stand out. Did that answer that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what the kind of typical return on angel investors are expecting? Uh, I mean, it depends on the angel investor. It depends on what they're doing. I mean, usually they want to see about a 25% IRR. Um, but, I mean, each person has their own portfolio and they're investing. Some people will invest in less risky companies knowing that they aren't looking for a home run potential. Others are unicorn hunting, knowing only one out of their 100 portfolio companies is going to be a unicorn. Right. So that's between the individual angel and, and their um, you know, investment strategy. Yep. You said a term I don't think a lot of people know. What does IRR mean? I was at internal rate of return. So it standardizes the return over the amount of time it was out. So basic way to look at it is if an investor invested a million dollars, um, and wanted to get a 25% IRR, I think that would have to return, what, $5 million? I mean, it's, it then looks at the amount of time. So essentially, like a shorter return over a short, over a smaller window of time has a higher IRR than a larger return over a really long amount of time. So um, every year it should be multiplied by 1.95. Yeah, I mean, Excel will do the calculation for you. Um, yeah. How uh, heavily I-10, I-10 or I-10? I-10, I believe, or have I been out pronouncing it wrong? Is it I-10? I-10. Uh -huh. yeah. okay. yeah. yes. Is it uh, very heavily focused on IT or life sciences companies also? No, tech, no, IT, tech product companies, scalable tech product companies, which is, is uh, more and more because you know we do have some that bridge both. They're, they have informatics sides to their life, you know, sometimes their health tech companies or their um, ag tech companies um, or their uh, products that are adding smart components. But if, if there's a tech product, a commercializable tech product component to your company, we can help you. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, so is the purpose of the seed accelerator to get these companies to a angel investor or VC, or is it to kind of help the company? I mean, it really depends on the accelerator. So, like the 630 guys, I think they're calling themselves more business development accelerators. So, they want you to already have a product on the market and early customers, and they're helping you scale up your ability to sell into enterprise level customers. Um, at Canopy San Diego, we were super early stage. We were literally like just beyond concept for a lot of our companies. And our goal was to literally be the first money in, get them organized um, to get their product launched, get them in with some early customers or some pilot programs, and then get them introduced to some very early stage investors that were interested in, in that niche. Um, 
you know, I mean, and then there's, I mean, like Stadia Ventures, they're very specific for sports technology, so, I mean, I don't know, you know, I mean, they might just, their biggest value proposition might be, we're going to get you into the sports technology industry, which in itself may be very difficult to get into. I think there's a, you know, fashion um, accelerator in town. Again, when you get into these niche ones, their larger value proposition is we can take someone from outside the industry and get them into the industry, and sometimes it's that industry's connection that will get you those early customers, which can get you the traction to go to more traditional angel investment. Does that, does that answer that? Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. So your background, biochemistry, immunology, so, but you're doing this for ITIN, which is typically uh, IT kind of startups, uh, more uh, likely uh, software. So yeah. it, it, it applies across the way. Where no, you, things are very different on the on the biotech side. I mean, yeah, because, because of meeting. regulation and getting through swab. <coughs> well, I mean, the amount of capital you need, you know, I mean, it's like $30 million to go through a phase one clinical trial. You know, they call the FDA the great equalizer. You know, it doesn't matter how amazing your team is or how crappy your team is, you know, if your product works and is safe, you get through, um, which is very different than tech. But I mean, Tech Coast Angels recruited me to do life science deals. When they brought me on full time, they told me I'd learn tech. Can't be it was tech. So I mean, I've been solid on the tech side for probably five years now. But fundraising tech versus fundraising life science, very, very different. Returns are very different. You've got a much higher failure rate, but when you hit, you know, every hit is 100x. How did you migrate? Um, I started working with Techos Angels. They liked me. I liked them. They asked me if I could learn tech. I told them I had an iPhone, so they hard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, out of respect for the next group, I'm going to get to stack around the And if you have, don't already have one of our um, impact reports, um, more information about I-10 programs and also our ecosystem map if you're trying to navigate the St. Louis ecosystem. There's a couple of really handy maps. They're right back there. Paul, raise your hand. Back by Paul at the table. Um, but if you can talk to Jack's going to be moving out to the community gallery. Yeah. We can move that way so the people that have the 630 slide can come in and set up. Thanks for coming, guys. See you next month.